Okay guys, in this video series we're going to take a look at electronegativity and how that plays a role in bonding for uh, different atoms. Now first of all, electronegativity, when you talk about that, electronegativity refers to this uh, tendency or this attraction of an atom to gain electrons. In our previous videos we talked about ionization energy, which was the energy required to remove an electron. Well, with, ele with electronegativity we're talking about what is that ability to gain them. Okay, so a little quick video here to start this off to talk about what that means in terms of gaining electrons from other atoms. An atom attempts to attract electrons toward itself when bonding with another atom. The level of attraction of each atom is called its electronegativity. When sodium and chlorine react, the chlorine atom removes sodium's valence electron and becomes a chloride ion. The less electronegative sodium atom cannot compete for electrons and becomes a sodium ion. The attraction between the ions is an ionic bond. When bonding atoms have nearly equal electronegativities, neither can attract electrons away from the other. In a carbon-sulfur bond, the electron pair is shared almost equally between the two atoms, resulting in a covalent bond. When hydrogen and oxygen react, the more electronegative oxygen atom cannot completely remove an electron from hydrogen. The shared electrons are attracted more to the oxygen than to the hydrogen atom. So you see in this part here that even though um, oxygen has a higher electronegativity, it's not high enough to completely remove it from hydrogen. Instead, the sharing is just unequal. So that electronegativity is a way for us to numerically or to quantify this ability of oxygen to hold on to the electron better than hydrogen in a bond. This unequal sharing is called a polar covalent bond. Polar bonds have a slightly negative and a slightly positive end. Okay, so let's take a look at the actual trend for electronegativity now. So if we take a look here, uh, again, here's our definition. So electronegativity is the tendency of an atom to attract electrons when it bonds with another atom. And if we look, it looks like purple is our main group, S block. Green is our main group, P block. And then red is our transition metals here, our D block. So if you look, all of our um, main group, our uh, alkali metals and alkaline earth metals, those S block things, they have really low electronegativities. So their tendency or their ability to gain electrons is very low. If you take a look, as you go from left to right across the periodic table, so you go from, uh, let's say, sodium to um, magnesium to aluminum to silicone to phosphorus to sulfur, as we go across the table, it looks like that electronegativity increases and then kind of resets itself again. And as you move to across the table again, it seems to get bigger and bigger. So at first glance, you might think, well, oh, that's pretty easy. Um, as you move from left to right across the table, electronegativity just gets bigger. It gets stronger, um, which actually matches the ionization energy. Uh, again, we see the same trends here. So as you move across the table, electronegativity tends to get higher. Um, we do see some hiccups, and we'll talk about those in this video also. And then we also see, if we actually include the lanthanide series here, how that would also increase as you go across the table. Now, a couple of things we had to look at here, though, in a little bit more detail. Uh, first of all is what's going on between this point right here and this point right here. And then also, we need to look at what's going on in these spots right here, here, and here. So if you notice, as you go across the table, we see an increase of electronegativity, or this increase in ability to gain electrons. But then you see a pretty significant drop-off at zinc, cadmium, and mercury. Now, if you remember, zinc, cadmium, and mercury were also part of one of our exceptions uh, in previous videos. So zinc, cadmium, and mercury are all group 12 elements. If you look at group 12, we notice that in group 12, we have a full D orbital. So with the full D orbital, zinc, cadmium, and mercury, and anything else in group 12 really does not have much of a tendency to gain electrons. For them to gain an electron really isn't much of an advantage in terms of stability because they already have a relatively stable configuration. So you'll see kind of this drop off at this midpoint where you aren't going to really want to gain electrons anymore. And also group 13 and stuff following it need to kind of reset themselves because group 13 
Again, it only has one valence electron in its p orbital, so it really doesn't want to gain electrons. Uh, it actually would rather get rid of that electron. So very much like an alkali metal, group 13 elements, which fall right here, um, so here we have our gallium and indium and thallium, they tend to be very low also. Um, so similar region of an exception as the ionization energy, but we don't see the dip in the same spot. If you remember, for ionization energy, we saw a spike at zinc, cadmium, and mercury, but now we see the dip at them. So it's kind of a little bit opposite there in terms of our trends. Besides that, um, that and only one other location, actually electronegativity and ionization energy follow the same trend. Because if you think about it, if it takes a lot of energy to take an electron away from you, you also should have a really high tendency to gain them. Okay, I sometimes tell a story of somebody who is really frugal or cheap that to get them to spend money, if you have a cheap person um, that you're a friend of, to get them to spend money takes a lot of energy to get them to go out and have fun and spend some money. That same person probably has a really strong tendency to make money or gain money. So those trends actually match each other. They're not inverse. They're actually directly related to each other. Where we see a difference here is in group 12 because we get that drop off because of the stability. Now another thing that we notice is there's actually some breaks in this trend where we're actually missing some stuff. So if you look, there is no dot for helium. There is no place for neon. There is no dot for argon. So it's almost like we've ignored the noble gases in terms of electronegativity. And in reality is we kind of do that. If you think about it, noble gases are stable. They have stable configuration. They don't tend to make bonds, they don't tend to make compounds at all. So when it comes to electronegativity, they really don't have a tendency or they don't have an ability to gain electrons. It doesn't do them any good. Um, so usually when you see electronegativity, you see that they're ignored or that they actually don't show them on any of the tables uh, because essentially they don't have an electronegativity or there is no desire to gain electrons here. Okay. So they're kind of like zinc, cadmium, and mercury, but just on a much greater scale in terms of you could almost say they have zero or no electronegativity because they really don't have a desire to gain electrons. Here's another spot where we see that electronegativity and ionization energy are very opposite because helium would have an extremely high ionization energy because it does not want to lose electrons or it takes a lot of energy to get rid of them. But also, because it's a stable atom, it doesn't want to gain them either. So at these places of stability, uh, zinc, cadmium, and mercury, and especially at the noble gases, is really where we see that break or that change in our trends. Besides that, electronegativity and ionization energy actually match trends fairly well. I kind of like this graphic here. It kind of shows um, an idea of uh, a visual to help us out where we have really low electronegativities over here. Cesium being a very big atom, um, having a very low ionization energy, we would also expect it to have a very low electronegativity. Where we go way over here with fluorine being our most electronegative substance, it's definitely the most reactive of all the nonmetals. Um, fluorine is extremely small, which means being small, it has a, a good ability to grab electrons from other things. If you can imagine fluorine colliding with another element, fluorine's nucleus, because it's one of the smaller atoms, is actually very close to its outer levels, which means when it collides with other atoms, that nucleus might be closer to those outer level electrons of the other substance than the, that, substance's, that substance's own nucleus. So essentially, fluorine has this really great ability, or actually the best ability, to gain electrons from everything. Um, then oxygen, then nitrogen, and chlorine, and so forth. So this corner over here, where you have really strong um, electronegativity is also where you're looking at your smallest atoms. Now, of course, we exclude helium and neon here because those are noble gases. Okay, so again, electronegativity is all about size. If we take a look at our chart, uh, in terms of electronegativity, we tend to increase as we go from left to right, and we tend to increase as we go up. Okay, uh, these values, if you actually want to look at numerical values, if you flip over your periodic table that I gave you, uh, on the back side of that periodic table, there's actually a chart for electronegativity values because we'll use that, those numerical values uh, later on in our next unit, actually, when we talk about bonding and covalent versus ionic bonding and that kind of stuff. Okay, For now, we're more interested in the actual trend. So we know that fluorine is the highest, cesium down here, francium, they're the lowest, and we tend to get more as we go across. We have a drop-off at 12, 
and then we rebuild again up to those halogens. And then one thing you can't forget is the noble gases we exclude when we talk about electronegativity. All right, so here's your reason why. Going across the period, the atoms get smaller. Again, it's all about size. So the nucleus is closer to the small atom compared to other large atoms. This allows the protons from the smaller atom to strip the electrons from the bigger atom because of its stronger electromagnetic pull. Going down the group, they get bigger, and secondarily, I'm not sure if that's actually a word or not, but secondarily, there is more electron shielding. So because you have a big atom and more shielding, as you go down the actual periodic table, the ability to gain electrons reduces. Okay? So you want the smallest atoms possible to have the highest electronegativity, excluding the noble gases, of course. Okay, guys, that actually ends the video on electronegativity. Uh, remember, we have those Socrative quizzes that we can do to review this stuff and work on also, so those are there for you guys to check out also. Thank you.